लेट्स टॉक अबाउट प्रोपियोसेप्टिव न्यूरोमस्कुलर फैसिलिटेशन और पी एन एफ टूडे सो वॉट इज पी एन एफ इफ यू ब्रेक डाउन दिस हैवी कॉन्सेप्ट वी गेट थ्री वर्ड्स प्रोपियोसेप्टिव न्यूरोमस्कुलर एंड फैसिलिटेशन प्रोपियोसेप्टिव इज एनीथिंग रिलेटेड टू सेंसरी रिसेप्टर्स विच डिटेक्ट मूवमेंट एंड पोजिशन ऑफ द बॉडी न्यूरोमस्कुलर इज रिलेटेड टू नर्व एंड मसल एंड फैसिलिटेशन मीन्स टू एनहेंस और मेक ईजियर देर फोर पी एन एफ इज एन थेरेप्यूटिक मैनोवर दैट एनहेंसेज द एक्शन ऑफ नर्व एंड मसल बाय स्टिमुलेटिंग द प्रोप्रियोसेप्टर्स ऑफ द बॉडी इट इन्फ्लुएंसेज द बॉडी मूवमेंट्स बाय मेकिंग यूज ऑफ ह्यूमन एनाटॉमी एंड न्यूरोफिजियोलॉजी now i have probably said the word proprioceptors a lot of times so let's look a little deeper into it proprioceptors are biological sensory devices that detect movement and position of the body for example muscle spindle activates stretch reflex and reciprocal inhibition golgi tendons activate autogenic inhibition If you want to know more about this I have a separate video on it that is given in the description Let's carry on joint receptors detect position of the body and also detect traction and approximation in joint surfaces Sensory organs like skin is used to touch and feel eye is used to see and ear is obviously to listen so basically all these devices will help us to understand how our environment is and how can we react towards it the mechanisms working behind this are stretch reflex autogenic inhibition and reciprocal inhibition to know more about this you can watch the video given in the description in short stretch reflex is when the muscle is lengthened and it then contracts in reflex autogenic inhibition occurs when the muscle contracts and it then relaxes in reflex reciprocal inhibition occurs when agonist is being contracted and the antagonist relaxes during the time other neurophysiologic mechanisms are after discharge that says that stimulus ends in response temporal summation says that many weak stimuli on same site will end in response spatial summation says that stimuli on different sites can also generate response and irradiation or overflow says that stronger muscles help weaker muscles in generating the response proprioceptors allow animal to stabilize against disturbing environment like wobbly surface stairs and refine complex movements which is to say that we stimulate sensory input to enhance motor output so this sensory inputs are received by proprioceptors here are the components of pnf that is to say that if you leave any of this 10 things while performing the pnf on a patient then it will be considered incomplete so the components are manual touch resistance stretch traction and approximation verbal and visual information overflow timing body position and body mechanics patterns and techniques let's look at them one by one manual touch the proprioceptor is skin for touch sensation the therapist touches the part to be moved for example if elbow flexion is to be produced by patient therapist touches and holds the flexor aspect of forearm resistance the proprioceptor is muscle to gain strength sensation the therapist applies resistance against motion for example if elbow flexion is to be produced by patient the therapist touches and holds the flexor aspect of forearm and resists flexion stretch proprioceptor is muscle spindle to gain stretch sensation the therapist stretches the muscle for example if elbow flexion is to be produced by patient the therapist touches and holds the flexor aspect of the forearm and pulls it traction and approximation 
The proprioceptors are joint receptors that detect joint space sensation. The therapist increases or decreases space between the joints. So if elbow flexion is to be produced by patient, the therapist will either lightly pull apart the humerus from proximal radio ulnar joint or stick them together. Needless to say, whenever we perform extension, we go for approximation and for flexion, we go for traction. Verbal and visual information. The proprioceptors are ear and eye to hear and see sensation. Therapist uses commands and tones to ask patient to initiate or correct the movement. For example, the patient may be commanded to close your hand pull up and across towards opposite shoulder. For visual information, the patient is asked to observe his or her own movements closely. Next is overflow. It is similar to how you would fill extra liquid in a mug and then it would overflow into the saucer and then onto the surface. So basically, stimulation of stronger and larger muscles leads to activation of smaller and weaker muscles. In simple language, overflow is the spread of stimulation. Timing. It refers to the sequencing of motion. Normal timing for coordinated and efficient movement is from distal to proximal. For example, in upper limb flexion, we would ask the patient to first flex the fingers, then the wrist, then the elbow. That is distal to proximal. This is the normal timing, but in timing for emphasis, we use personalized sequencing in which the wrist may be flexed before the fingers or the elbow may be flexed before the wrist. It depends on the patient condition. The next component is for the therapist's own body. It is body position and mechanics. The therapist's position should be in line of motion. That is why you will see that the therapist will acquire different positions for treating different parts of the body. The therapist uses his or her own weight to resist, pull or push towards the motion and not his arms. The therapist is in walk standing position. Because it is a very stable position and it helps to assemble the energy to apply resistance onto the patient's body. Patterns The PNF exercise pattern consists of three components flexion extension, abduction adduction, internal rotation and external rotation. These patterns mimic real life activities and are clinically designed. So just like dance moves, these are PNF moves. With that said, let's look at the patterns. We will be looking at the upper limb and lower limb patterns, although we also have the trunk patterns that we will be looking in another video. In upper limb, we have four patterns D1 flexion, D1 extension, D2 flexion, and D2 extension. In D1 flexion, our end goal is to achieve flexion external rotation and adduction and these movements will be incorporated by all the joints of the upper limb that is fingers wrist elbow and shoulder in d1 extension our end goal will be extension internal rotation and abduction of the joints of upper limb similarly in d2 flexion our end goal is flexion external rotation and abduction. In D2 extension, our end goal is extension, internal rotation and adduction. Patterns of lower limb involve the movements by ankle joint, knee joint and hip joint. In D1 flexion, the end position is flexion, adduction and external rotation. In D1 extension, the end goal is extension, abduction and internal rotation. Similarly, for D2 flexion, the end goal is flexion, abduction and internal rotation. And for D2 extension, the end goal is extension, adduction and external rotation. 
On these patterns, we then apply different techniques like repeated stretch, slow reversal, reversal of agonist, reversal of antagonist, rhythmic stabilization, different types of contract relax stretching methods and rhythmic initiation. For this, we are going to have another video on PNF. If you were able to understand the topic, like, share and subscribe.